First of all, uh, I thank the organizers for having me here. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, address this topic, which I also love to deliver because while I'm involved in this topic of discussion, and while uh, Dr. Ranjit and uh, Sanyal Madam had the confidence to bring me in, to deliver this uh, topic. So I would say it's my pleasure to address this topic. So while uh, participants today, the uh, topic, there, there are two uh, uh, topics which I'm discussing. One is that the advocate, okay, how we have to be uh, before the court regarding the forensic related activities and to the limited extent of the psychological evidences or how the psychology can effectively be adopted by an advocate for effective procedure of the legal procedures. So this is what is going to be my topic of discussion. But uh, the main topic which is allocated to me uh, is that the applicability of narco analysis and its importance in the court of law. So the first topic I'll be discussing about uh, this. While uh, we, it's very important for us to discuss on the history and the sources of the law, because history regarding the uh, lie detection techniques and uh, polygraph or narco or the brain mapping are various categories of the lie detection tests. So we are discussing about the lie detection as a whole thing and not just the uh, narco or the polygraph. We, whichever the method we use before the uh, court to submit our report that the person was a uh, person underwent a uh, lie detection test. So that particular aspect is what uh, we are discussing. But when we start discussing about why are we using this or is this kind of method applicable or is it valid or from where it all started? So this goes on to a very old traditional practice where the rulers of China were using a technique called the raw rice method. It might be very surprising for most of us because we have never heard about this uh, terminology ever before this. But the raw rice, how does it actually be used for lie detection? People, we have to understand that the lie detection technically is to be called as a PDD test. That PDD refers to psychophysiological detection of deception. That is a PDD. So when we say psychophysiological, it involves both the mind and the body and the combination of the effect of what you think in the mind and what your body undergoes in that particular moment, that particular study is what is indicating the stress on a person or we can actually say he is being normal. So the difference between the stress, what was shown at that particular moment versus the uh, kind of reaction what he showed for a normal or a genuine answers is what this tests will be conducted and technically to be referred as PDD techniques. So when the uh, raw rice method was used, the procedures was like this. The, when people are, the, when, when the subject is there, uh, whoever want to prove his innocence or people want to test him for his credibility, they were meant to put a handful of raw rice into their mouth and the question was asked. And after some time, they were asked to split the raw rice which was in their mouth. Based on the amount of rice which is coming out of their mouth, people were able to understand whether this person is being truthful or this person is being deceptive, just on the basis of amount of rice coming out. Because if it is a physiological reaction or a characteristic, that when your body is stressed, when, when your mind is stressed, the body will show off its reaction. You might be starting sweating, you might be starting getting thirsty, your body temperature might go high. So there are several uh, you know, reactions which would, uh, uh, which would correlate to you being stressful or in not a normal state of mind would usually be in. So this raw rice, me raw rice method starts from there. So this only proves that when your mind is not completely free, the body has to react to it. So based on this concept, the researchers have been conducted. And today, we are effectively using the lie detection tests as a scientific evidence before the court. However, 
I'll I do uh, discuss about the acceptability of this kind of reports before the court in my further topic of discussion. But this is to understand the, this technique, what we are presently uh, are claiming it to be a live detection test is purely a scientific methodology. And uh, when we say psychology and it is scientific, we should also understand only in the recent days, psychology has been given a recognition as a scientific subject. Otherwise, it was a subject of arts. So now we have transformed the whole point of discussion from the topic of discussion on the skill to the topic of discussion towards the science. So today, when we're discussing about this topic, we are discussing about a topic of science and not just an art. However, the procedure of the uh, activity, what we conduct as a polygraph, that might include a bit of skill, which is uh, art, what is required, but the platform is purely a scientific methodology. When we are discussing about this, and when we have to use this as a rule, or when we have to say that you know the courts should accept this kind of practice, or courts should be open to accept this kind of evidences, it all starts with the question of sources of the law. So what is the law? When, when people ask, what is the law? We, we, time and again, we keep discussing about different kinds of law, okay? Uh, when, when this controversy happened on the media, they talk about uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, laws in Islamic countries versus the laws in democratic countries, which means the laws are different based on their practice, based on their culture, based on their belief systems. So these are the basics or these are the backgrounds which actually gets the law what we are practicing today. However, on my slide, I've already mentioned uh, there is an asterisk mark, which actually means in India, whatever is a practice, whatever is your customs, whatever is your traditions, if at all it contradicts with the constitution of India, that practice is said to be not legal. That is what our stand in India it is. So for this reason, today when we're discussing about a law or a rule of how the polygraph can be used or what is the reliability of the polygraph, now we have got two understandings. One is that the reliability of the polygraph is such because it's a scientific subject. And as a rule, there has been given certain guidelines. The rule is because it was existing as a practice. So because of this practice, this was also made as a rule on how and why it can be accepted as a uh, uh, evidence or why or why not, when and when not to accept this kind of approaches in the uh, uh, litigation process. When we discuss about the lie detection, I just now uh, covered the topic where there are various elements, various uh, methods of detecting the lie, but only few can be demonstrated. Only few can be documented. So like this, we are, we are specifically discussing for the code of law, we are specifically discussing about brain mapping, narco, and polygraph. These are the three major categories of evidences which can be demonstrated and documented. However, there are other techniques which can effectively detect the lie, which includes the eye contact, the micro expressions, and the body language. So however, eye contact, micro expressions, and body language, to a larger extent, we correlate these characteristics with the previous uh, the list what we're discussing when we're doing a polygraph test. So though the polygraph is purely based on the PDD where there are uh, several uh, hardware and softwares which are involved in all the three, uh, brain mapping, narco, and polygraph, so for the rest, eye contact, micro expressions, and body language, there is no external gadget what you actually require, except for your keen observation. And to a larger extent, if in case you want to demonstrate and justify yourself, you might require a camera these days so that you can capture and demonstrate as to what, he, what made you to conclude that the person whom you are examining is lying or being deceptive but purely based on the uh, observation tactics only. But other three have certain hardware and software which can be used for documenting 
which can further be demonstrated upon the requirement. While if, if uh, the question is that why should the polygraph be used or what is that it can get to our investigator? So definitely, as everybody knows, people think if, if in any case we put a person on a polygraph test or a, a narco test or lie detection test, the case can be solved. That is what the approach for our outsider is. But in this slide, we'll discuss about both scope and limitation of this test. First of all, it is a reality that this tool has been used by several investigation agencies across the globe. And this statement is not just you know, uh, made from myself, but many of you know, in many movies you would have seen how the NIA or CIA, FBI, you know, every, everybody you know, have been using the polygraph uh, uh, tests in their uh, investigations. It could also be included in their loyalty test of their own employees, the agents who work in Interpol and other uh, intelligence agencies, they might have to undergo the loyalty test using this kind of tools. Are you working only for our agency or are you a double agent? So these things can effectively be answered. See, because when people are trained to use the technology, they won't leave any kind of traces to a larger extent, okay? But when this approach is used, this is more to do with your psychology. So here, there is more chances, even if there is no material evidences which are found, at least using this kind of tools, uh, indications uh, could be given as to whether he can be a trusted person or he is going to be a double agent. So for this reason, it is one of the tools which is used by several investigation agencies across the globe. But when I say this, this also makes you understand how open uh, this tool is and if the tool is not valid, if the tool is not a, a legal tool, so people would not be using this. So I'll, I'll justify this statement very soon, but I just want you to think with this reality as to how this tool have been used. Second, it's a scientific tool having evidentiary value. Of course, the court of law does not believe in stories, whatever degree the emotional story it could be. But the court of law requires some kind of evidentiary value which, which, which goes only by the documentary evidence or some kind of corroborative evidence before the court of law. Otherwise, the court cannot decide the matter. Because we have a jurisprudence that the benefit of doubt in any, any given case should be given to the accused. Even if one person you have a doubt, you cannot convict. The accused is what the jurisprudence says. It also goes and says, even if 100 criminals are acquitted, one innocent person should not be convicted. So for this reason, the court requires some kind of evidentiary value beyond the reasonable doubts. So this tool definitely has got that kind of reliability to show before the court, what is it want to communicate? And this communication has got some kind of evidentiary value. And I'll justify the statement soon when I discuss about the court of law. Third, the question before us, when we say it's a lie detection tool, the answer to this or the understanding this uh, statement should be, this tool can effectively detect the lie and the deception. There is a difference between the truth detection and the lie detection. This is a negative approach. Matlab, when we say it's a lie detection test, so which NARPO is one among it. We are trying to detect the lie and we are not trying to detect the truth. And yes, if, if you start thinking about this, this is a big you know, uh, uh, dimension uh, of what is truth on, on one particular axis. What is false is completely on the opposite axis. Both are not the same. Detecting the lie is not detecting the truth. So both are on two different axes, which is totally opposite, which is totally different. So for this reason, using this tool, we are trying to detect the lie and not the truth. This acts as an extra feather for an investigator, no doubt about it. 
because it makes some process of the investigation a bit easy. However, in, in several cases, okay, the previous crimes can also be detected with one particular test. Because if, if the person is brought to the polygraph or the narco analysis test, why in the test, if in case we ask the person, have you ever done similar crime before this? Or have you ever done the same kind of theft before this? And he says, no, yes, we can detect the lie. That means this person could be involved in more number of crimes before the uh, investigation officer. So this old crimes can also be detected using this. And yes, techniques are admitted by several courts across the globe. This goes answering with the first line of discussion because it's a tool used by several agencies and it's admitted by several courts across the globe. With all said and done, the question to every one of us, okay, you might have some people around you whom you would categorize them. He's a, uh, you know, uh, a person uh, who can effectively lie to me. He, you know, when he says something, I totally believe in him. So it means he is effectively lying. No, you are not trying to detect the deception traits in his statement. The fault is not from the other person, but the fault is from your side because you are failing to detect that kind of uh, you know, uh, deviations from their normal pattern of uh, discussion. So it is not easy to lie. It is not easy to lie, but it is also true that it is not easy to detect the lie. So you must train yourself to understand those kind of reactions, those kind of uh, changes in their body language, voice, statements, okay, and the micro expressions, everything does matter for you to understand, to, uh, to rely upon the person's statement. So as for the, uh, the theory of PDD, psychophysiological detection of deception, whenever you lie, the body will react. So that reaction, if you have the ability, is to be noted and observed. That is what the skill which is required from your side to do this. I am not talking about, I'm talking about the normal course of our life. I'm not talking about the typical narco analysis test or the typical polygraph test. So to, for the typical polygraph test, the system or the hardware and softwares will record all these changes. But for you to understand, is lying so easy? No, lying is not so easy because there's a conflict in the mind. Because conscious mind, I mean, is trying to deceive, whereas the subconscious mind it keeps on saying, hey, you're doing something wrong. When you know that you're doing something wrong, the body will react to it. So for this reason, lying is not so very easy, but looking for the leakage from the baseline is what is very important for a normal person to detect the lie. When we have to discuss about the limitations, there are, there are uh, two limitations. One is that I have already discussed that this is the technique or the tool which is used for effective detection of the lie, but not effective detection of the truth. That is one technical limitation. But the second limitation in India is a process of legal admissibility in India. It is a very famous judgment uh, in the case of Selvi versus state of Karnataka. This is when we are touching upon the techno-legal aspects of this particular topic. Because so far we discussed about the scientific validity and scientific uh, you know, uh, possibilities of the narco or the PDD techniques. But is that admissible in the court of law in India? If that is a question, this is a rule book. Selvi versus state of Karnataka, I would say it is a rule in India for every person who want to know about the polygraph to read this complete judgment, because this is a beautiful piece of judgment in which the judge has discussed all the tactics, all the, all the uh, categories of the lie detection tests, the process of each of those tests, how each of those tests can possibly violate the constitutional rights of an individual. So whether if it is permissible or not, if it is permissible, in what procedure it can be permitted, and 
the nodal agency for the human rights, which is the National Human Rights Commission. They have also given certain guidelines on how this kind of lie detection tests can be conducted. So this judgment acts as a rule for the narco test in India or the lie detection tests in India. But to note, through this judgment, there is a ban to conduct the brain mapping technique as well as the narco technique in any litigation cases in India for this time being. These two techniques, even though it is highly considered to be the scientific, but as a rule in India, these two techniques are not allowed to be used. However, polygraph is allowed to be used. Polygraph is another technique for detecting the lie. So for this reason, polygraph tests are allowed, but not the narco or the brain mapping techniques because of this judgment. What this judgment talks, this judgment does not in any way say that the polygraph test is not scientific. There's, there's a misconception of uh, this kind of judgments by several people outside because whenever any judgment comes in, every person would try to interpret in their own way. Just another case of example, uh, when the uh, Supreme Court okay, said adultery is not a criminal offense, 497, uh, when it was said adultery is not a criminal offense, people started to interpret saying that, oh, court of law in India made adultery legal. That, that's how they tried to interpret it. However, the actual meaning of the judgment was it, adultery cannot be tried as a criminal offense, but that can be a reason for the divorce, which is a separate jurisdiction of litigation. So like this, there are several cases where people try, have tried and effectively and being successful in misinterpreting. But the understanding about this case law is that this polygraph or the lie detection tests are not to be used without the consent or the permission uh, from the magistrate. That is what this rule book says. Otherwise, before this case law, any accused in a particular case could have been subjected to the polygraph test, whether he wishes to undergo or if he doesn't wish to undergo, he is compelled to undergo the polygraph test, which actually goes against the constitutional rights of an individual in India, exclusively Article 20, sub clause 3 of Indian Constitution, which says no person accused of any offense shall be compelled to be a witness against himself, which means what are the statements he gives, those statements are held against him because it is, it is purely on his response is what we are trying to calculate, whether he's trying to be truthful or deceptive. So that statement would be held against him. So for this reason, this constitutional rights would actually uh, govern the possibility of the polygraph tests in India. So because of this constitutional right, the Supreme Court has held the polygraph test results cannot be I mean, polygraph test or uh, the lie detection tests cannot just be conducted as per the uh, uh, discretion or the whims and fancies of the investigation officers. So with this judgment, they have given the step-by-step -step approach on how this can be conducted because court of law also knows the, uh, the, the, the purpose and the outcome of this kind of tests. If this test is not scientific or it is not of any use, Court should have discarded the whole procedure of the polygraph, but court has not done that. This goes, when the court has admitted this, this is when I said, there's a long lasting practice of this kind of techniques. And today it is scientific. So for these two reasons, the court has given guideline on how this can be used as an evidence before the litigation process. So, uh, uh, as, as a limitation is concerned, I want to also highlight that it can ascertain the lie, but it cannot find the truth, which means 100 different lies can actually uh, imply there's only one possible truth. But because a person is lying, I cannot say what the truth, or I cannot effectively conclude what the truth is. So this is a limitation. So say, for example, I'm going to ask a participant 
is your name Miss X? And she says, for example, yes. And in my system, okay, I would see that the person is lying. I can only say this person is not X, but I cannot say what her actual name is. So like this, this is a negative approach of the uh, investigation process. So this cannot effectively detect the truth, but it can imply what the truth is. Polygraph tests are often criticized because there has been cases where people or the subjects have effectively used countermeasures. Artificially, a subject can you know, alter these kind of body reactions. When I say PDD, the physiological reactions, what I'm talking about, this could include the sweat, the temperature, the uh, pulse, breathing rate. So all these things are the physiological reactions. So you can artificially or intentionally can alter these uh, parameters. If you ask me how, all you have to do is you can just bite your tongue, which gets you a lot of pain, or pinch yourself. And suddenly look at your pulse, look at your body temperature. Because of the pain, there will be a change. So this is called countermeasures in the polygraph test. But there cannot be effective countermeasures when there is an experienced an expert who is doing this polygraph because the expert can effectively detect what are the uh, possible countermeasures the person is actually adopting to. So it could be a failure of the examiner or intentional negligence of the examiner. We have seen that the polygraph has been taken a name that it is not reliable evidence or it is, it, it is something which people can cheat. That is what the uh, crown which has been earned by the previous uh, ex so-called experts, okay? Yes, this polygraph can actually lead to consumption of a lot of time because testing one issue can lead to multiple sub-issues. So in several cases, this could go very long time of discussions because of which the patients of the examiner, patients of the subject, patients of the investigation agencies, can also be tested to a larger extent because the polygraph is usually adopted because the investigation officer wants to find something very quick because these kind of tests are usually conducted in high profile cases. So for this, every investigation agency would be in tremendous stress and pressure from different uh, you know, uh, administrative authorities. So they have to get the things uh, no, fata -fata -fata -fata. but in several cases, this doesn't happen so fast. It might lead to multiple sub-issues, which has to be tested one by one. So for this reason, it might be a time-consuming process. When the question is about the guidelines of National Human Rights Commission, which is a nodal agency for the human rights protection in India, so they have already given the list of uh, uh, such guidelines, how the polygraph can be adopted uh, in, in the litigation cases. When this is a question, uh, I don't want to uh, discuss uh, you know, much about this, but this is something which you can also get on the uh, internet. If you, all you have to do is just Google NHRC guidelines for lie detection. The tagline, you will get to see or get to download the content from the NHRC guide, the website itself. Okay, so there's a, a document which you can access as well as Selvi versus State of Karnataka, the, the famous judgment in that as well, these guidelines are reproduced in that judgment. So if you don't know the judgment, that is one document to understand the scope, possibilities of the polygraph in India. And in addition to this, you can also refer the NHRC guidelines for lie detection as an extra reference. Apart from this, when the question is about how these psychological things can effectively be used in the court, or is there any scope for psychology in the court? The answer is yes. And this statement, after, after this statement, what I am trying to communicate is purely based on the skill. So far, I discussed about the technical and legal procedures of conducting narco analysis test or the light detection test. But when advocate is in the court, when he has to cross-examine the witnesses, 
it is purely a psychological game okay though in the books of the law nobody talks about the psychological aspects of anything there is no guidelines uh, given for any kind of psychological significance of connecting the cross examination or something like that it, it goes purely by the experience of the advocate but there is a larger amount of psychology which is involved before the court during the trial because it's purely a mind game to convince the court it is a mind game to uh, confuse the court it is again the mind game so to corrupt the court it is again different kind of mind game so the three c factors are effectively used only based on the psychological factors because even to corrupt somebody in the court it requires the psychology because you should know what is their weakness you should know what are their pleasure factors that is when you can try to uh, you know make them corrupt we have seen the honey trap cases okay you see this is where they are trying to do the corruption they know what the weakness and they are trying to corrupt them so otherwise they could have actually you know uh, convince them are boss uh, i am i am a pakistani spy okay, please get convinced and give me your data they will not give it because of that they will actually corrupt them so like this the factors which would lead which would require before the court is purely a psychology flavor but material evidence is a scientific document that's different it requires a larger amount of psychology flavor to present it before the court when we discuss about the cross examination cross examination it purely depends on where the advocate stands what is the distance between the advocate and the witness which who is in the witness box the tone in which the advocate communicates the uh, the see, the distance between the advocate and the judge the distance between advocate and the witness so all these things has a larger uh, you know understanding about the psychology because nobody feels very comfortable if a unknown person to whom you are answerable comes very close to you and asks you the question you 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 are prepared to answer no doubt about it but not coming so close and asking you some question so there is uh, definitely a private space a personal space and a social space around everyone so you don't allow any uh, you know first any stranger to come to your private or personal space okay remember when you want to take a delivery of swiggy zomato or any courier so the distance between you and the person is just equal to your arms uh, arm length you will not go very close to take that consignment in hand all you have to do is just collect it is a total stranger for you but if a known person comes to you to deliver something so you would go a step closer to collect that particular thing from him or if it is a uh, uh, you know a intimate relationships only then you would allow people to come to your private space so for this reason so this private personal and social space is a larger understanding about the uh, effect of this space on your psychology at that point in time that's very very important addition to this for an advocate to understand the micro expressions before the uh, the when the person is in the witness box and the advocate is asking some questions to the uh, person and if you have a good understanding about the micro expressions that would give you a added advantage to understand whether this person is getting frustrated whether this person is getting angry because of these questions whether this person is getting disgusted with these questions so because of that you can reframe your approach and get your desirable answers that is a solution for that and third but not the least in this slide questioning categories you cannot keep on asking the person all the direct and relevant questions one by one because for a, for for a criminal if you want to ask him why did you commit a crime he is prepared to answer that did you commit the crime he is prepared to answer that but in the questioning category in the same judgment they also clearly described on what are all the different categories of questioning they discuss about irrelevant questions controlled questions relevant questions so when an advocate knows about this questioning category we can effectively play a complete psychological game and effectively break the preparation of the witness who is in the witness box because 
the the role and responsibility of the advocate especially when he is a cross examiner is to break the reliability of the witness so for this the advocate will go to any extent so to go to any extent there should be a material evidence to support or there can be only psychological factors because of which the witness can totally be disturbed and to get the desired answers to demonstrate before the court that this person is not a reliable expert or reliable evidence so he is not psychologically stable he has he has stated something which is not true so it it purely depends on the psychological reaction of the witness uh, before that on contrary if in case you are an expert standing before the court as a witness you have to be conscious about these things because the cross examination is conducted to break your preparation so for this reason you have to be psychologically very strong emotionally very strong so which we learn attending several of the cross examinations okay so we know what categories of questions do they ask and how and all do they try to break our preparation so this is a purely though the material evidences might be scientific but the presentation and approach before the court of law because even today in 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 the courts across the world the judgments are delivered by the human beings and as well as human beings are delivering the judgment it is the psychology which actually triggers which actually you know impacts them to a certain extent in addition to the material evidences before the case so with this i would conclude my session and with with a statement that yes the uh, the approach of narco and narco uh, analysis in india might be very limited not for the reason it is not scientific it is for the reason it is constitutionally uh, violating the rights of an individual for the reason that is uh, the judgment which you can refer additionally the psychology before the court plays a very critical role especially in terms of presenting and creating that impact before the court uh, to lead your evidence so participants uh, with this i am concluding my session uh, on time uh, i was given 45 minutes so i would uh, conclude my session and this is where you can follow me on the social media so now the session is over to the host thank you very much